Is the sound not coming through? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, it's good. Yeah, I've got your sound. Okay, excellent. They they say that the webcam here uh, it's okay because they have a real camera uh, taking the footage. So this is just for the convenience. こんにちは、大鳥さん。<laughs> Hello, Audrey. Hello. Yeah, I'm very glad to see you. Me too. And talking with you. Yes. Yes. Uh, and firstly, I want to ask you about the earthquake last night. Yes. Is there any damages? Uh, not uh, far as uh, I can see, uh, but all my phones uh, received this national emergency warning. So it proves that the national emergency system is working really well. <laughs> see, see, see. It's good. Yeah. Anyway, mm, I'm very happy to talking with you. You are the person, one of the person who I most want to speak, see in the, in the world. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, really glad uh, to uh, be talking with you. I understand we have a lot of time, like two and a half hours, uh, to cover yes, a know. wide range of topics. Yes, yes. But, you know, I think you already recognize my English is not so good. No, it's very good. It's certainly better than my <laughs> Nihongo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Today, I need uh, se uh, some help for translate. So I want to introduce you, our interpreter. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, those are... Can you see? Sanae san Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Very nice meeting you. And uh, Hello, nice to Very meet nice you. Very nice meeting you. Yeah. They are very, how to say, gifted interpreter so we can talk more deeper further and I very good to good to mutual understanding giving our time excellent thank you so much I also work as an interpreter myself so I understand that I will now speak in roughly this speed to make your life easier thank you thank you very much so yeah. Uh, they are ready to for another room. Okay, can you see? Okay. Uh, can you see that this studio? This is a TBS G studio. Can you see? Miriam, Naru. I see only one part of it. The blue wall uh, but yes I, I can see many screens uh, arranged in a kind of u shape uh, around you so uh, it's uh, very nice mm -hmm. uh, your books well it's a book about me it's not my book uh, certainly I don't get royalties from its sales but it is of course the work of the president's press and uh, very diligent uh, editors so, I believe you are the most uh, famous Taiwanese in Japan. Yeah, I, I get the translation. Yeah, I can hear now the translation very well. Thank you. So, you are the most uh, famous Taiwanese uh, in Japan. Okay. Today, probably it's going to be slightly different from the normal interview. So our TV program, as our last program for this year, we are going to feature U.S.-China relationship, which is a huge um, topic for Japanese people. So, 
when there's some change in US and China relationship. The Taiwan is a country which uh, gets the, the highest impact, I believe. So now there's tension between US and China, and especially there's a tension of IT industries, um, especially they're related to 5G. So you are IT specialist. So that is why uh, we ask you to uh, join the conversation with us for our TV program this time. It's my honor. To start off, what do you see the the country or what do you see the nation? What is the meaning of state for you? To me, uh, I'm digitalminister.tw. So uh, .tw is the domain name. Uh, it's CCTLD, uh, meaning that it's country specific, like .jp. Uh, if I'm going to uh, enter digitalminister.tw anywhere in the world, I'm connecting back to a computer that I know and actually personally installed. When I become digital minister, I recompile the Linux kernel so that we can run uh, the systems that host the digital services. And so this reliability of typing digitalminister.tw anywhere in the world, regardless of jurisdiction, and connect back to a uh, computer that I am um, trusting myself uh, to set up. Uh, this is one of the meanings of the CCTLD, that is to say the country. So the, the country you imagine is a slightly different from a con uh, the idea of country we imagine. Well, I see myself as uh, a internet governance um, kind of ambassador uh, to the day-to-day -day Westphalian politics. So I always say that I'm working with the government here, the cabinet, that I'm not working for the cabinet here. I'm working with the people in Taiwan, but I'm not working for the people in Taiwan. I'm working with the internet community, which has this idea of rough consensus and open multi-stakeholderism. That is the political norm that I belong to. And I, of course, negotiate with co-governance, such as countries on one side, but also Facebook and Google on the other side, which are also co-governance uh, and is a political reality. Although .google is not a country name, it is a domain name. I see. So that is some sort of existing, which uh, which is um, over the countries. Um, I would say. Yeah, it's uh, as that, I said, uh, co-governance. Yes, like co-processors, GPU and CPU. However. Now, when we look at the reality, there's a conflict between the US and China, and the, there's lots of attention for that. And also that we are worrying about the negative impacts uh, coming from that uh, conflict. So how do you see that? Well, you mentioned that Taiwan um, is the country with the most tension. Uh, just yesterday, we were having this earthquake, like literally caught between the Eurasian plate on one side and the Philippine Sea plate on the other. And the tension released a lot of energy. Uh, and uh, we fortunately uh, designed resilience in our buildings so nobody gets hurt. But the uh, Jade Mountain or the Savia, the top of Taiwan, grow by another few millimeters uh, because of this earthquake. It grows every year two or three centimeters. So the idea is that conflict is not always bad. 
conflict makes people evaluate new innovations and new ideas. And our moment of 4G infrastructure in 2014 is based on a very similar conversation that the rest of the world is having now, namely whether the Beijing state subsidized components can make its way through private sector to the Taiwanese 4G infrastructure. And we occupy the parliament for three weeks, half a million people on the street, many more online, with 20 NGOs. We deliberated over each and every aspect of the trade deal with Beijing. And one part of it is the telecommunication. And the consensus on the street was that if we re-evaluate every time there's a firmware upgrade, every time there is a technological upgrade, every time there is a cybersecurity incident, then we have to evaluate again whether the vendor that supported this upgrade has been taken over by the Communist Party of the Beijing regime. And if we keep evaluating that for each upgrade, it's actually more expensive than working with Japan or working with uh, Nokia or Ericsson as suppliers. So the consensus on the street was very clear. People rejected PRC components from all sensitive security, including cybersecurity procurements. So ever after that, our 4G deployment contains 0% PRC components. And it took us a couple of years, but we eventually by 2015 removed all Beijing components from our infrastructure that powers our government service network. And so the decision has been made, the conversations already done. So we, did, we didn't have this debate for 5G because we kind of did that already six years ago. So now, the world is now the study to consider whether we sh they should took Chinese system um, to 5G or not. So how do you see that situation from the specialist or the professional's perspective? I'm not advising you to occupy your parliament. I'm not doing that. But I am uh, encouraging the same sort of all of society deliberation, the same sort of systemic risk analysis, because the cost effectiveness is not just about the monetary cost, it's also about amortized cost for each upgrade and so on. So my point is that it's not a top down thing. In 2014, the National Security Council and National Communication Commission in Taiwan agreed on these rules precisely because people who occupy the parliament won broad support from the society on this issue. And so a similar all of society conversation is needed. Of course, every jurisdiction may draw different conclusions. But regardless of conclusion, this kind of conversation strengthens democracy. So two years ago, I visited the headquarters of Huawei in Shenzhen. And the, of course, there's the issue of security, especially the related to security of the, the 5G technologies. However, what they said was that they would not follow the Communist Party. And if the Communist Party would insist a uh, far way to uh, follow their direction and the far way said that they would be happy to move to other countries uh, do you think that that this is the realistic scenario that the far way uh, would move to other countries if the communist party would insist them to follow the direction of the party well their freedom of movement may not be guaranteed we have seen uh, the beijing regime essentially swapping leadership for other high-tech companies 
Um, and so also for media companies, um, like recently in Hong Kong. Um, and so we have seen uh, several incidents uh, that makes us wary about the options that the so-called private sector people, if they are physically in the PRC territory, uh, what kind of real options they actually have. Uh, so yeah, may, they may say that and they may intentionally mean that, but whether the state, the communist state, uh, will actually allow such thing to happen, um, just look at recent history and maybe you can draw your own conclusion. So not only Huawei, but there are several so-called um, IT companies in China, and they do have a certain level of technologies. However, do you see them as a private company? What I'm trying to say is that if this is a one-time purchase, if there's no need to upgrade the firmware or upgrade the software, if this is, after all, not connected to the rest of the network infrastructure, then, uh, of course, uh, I mean, this mask uh, could be uh, made in the PRC territory. And that's fine, I'll still put it on, because it's not communication equipment. I I'm not anti-Chinese manufacturers. What I'm trying to say is that for something that is telecom um, component, it is not a purchase of a product. It is the beginning of a relationship of services. And you need to understand the amortized long-term continuity and resilience of that particular relationship, taking into account, for example, their access to high-end semiconductor chips or things like that. So it is a long-term decision to be made, whereas a single purchase of a single product that's not connected to the net, that doesn't have the upgrade path, this is actually one-time use, uh, then this is easier to evaluate than 5G components. Okay, uh, they say there's a problem with the sound, so I will plug in a different uh, connection to Ethernet and I will be back, be right back. <laughs> Uh, is it better now? Can you can you see and hear me? Yes. Okay, the sound is better? Okay. Uh well let's continue then. Okay, let's continue. So on the other hand, probably the, the U.S. is going to have the new uh, administration. So how, is there any ex expectation you have on the U.S. Uh, new administration? Um, first of all, I think it is bipartisan in the U.S. for the support uh, to Taiwan as a democratic country, as well as establishing international solidarity with, for example, the global cooperation and training framework, which used to be a Taiwan-US partnership, but is now a Japan-Taiwan-US partnership on the issues as varied as, you know, the infodemic, the pandemic, uh, climate change, uh, circular economy, there's many, many topics that we discuss over the GCTF platform. So I think there is a lot of continuity between the two different parties, regardless of whether it's the Trump or the Biden administration to keep working on those global topics uh, through this regional collaboration. However, talking about uh, President Trump, 
probably he was uh, not um he was not uh, willing to cooperate with um other countries um so did you have that kind of the feeling as well well in the trump administration's term a lot of international space is not only shared uh, with people in taiwan but we also established a lot of bilateral communications for example the digital dialogue uh, which is a series of four conversations about people-to-people -people ties, about security cooperation, about how to make Taiwan more uniquely seen in the world, as well as about economic and prosperity trade uh, relationships. And these are the first time that over the digital world, uh, the .tw and .us uh, did as conversation over the internet, what I call track zero diplomacy, uh, like uh, internet citizens to internet citizen diplomacy and we look forward to continue that with the AIT, the de facto U.S. Embassy. I also uh, think um, it's bipartisan people who supported the coronavirus hackathon, cohack.tw, which is another uh, transnational um, collaboration in cohack, C-O-H-A-C-K, the T-W where we work on how to counter the coronavirus together through international collaboration and open innovation. So uh, I think uh, from what I'm seeing in the digital realm, um, it is again a bipartisan thing. So, I now have some questions related to COVID-19. So, probably there are so many Japanese people who would love to fly to Taiwan now, because uh, Taiwan is uh, doing very well in terms of the, the prevention uh, of the, the pandemic. Taiwan is successfully controlling the pandemic. So you did have some initiatives related to masks, which is something that should be shared around the world, I believe. And However, as a platform, World Health Organization is being a bit tough on Taiwan. Probably there is a lot of pressure from the PLC. However, now it's a very important time for the world. However, still WHO does not allow Taiwan to attend uh, the platform, even as an observer uh, country. So why do you see this um, attitude of WHO or the, or the, the attitude of uh, PLC related to WHO? Well, it's sad because um, early on last December, actually, December 31st, when Dr. Li Wenliang's message uh, reached Taiwan, uh, he literally saved Taiwan from Wuhan. Uh, but his message didn't reach that many people in Wuhan uh, in the beginning. Uh, and on early January, uh, when we started uh, first on the 1st of January, health inspections for flights coming in from Wuhan, and early on the Central Epidemic Command Center, even before we had the first confirmed case, we tried to reach the WHO, and all we had was limited scientific access to other countries' science people but we do not have ministerial access, meaning that we do not have access to other countries' political authorities. And so because of this, I can say with certainty that the world lost 10 days because we responded 10 days before the WHO. And had we had ministerial access, maybe we would be able to convince some ministers that way. With the scientific access, I mean, in Taiwan, of course, our top expert of epidemiology at the time when he want to talk to the vice president, 
he just look into the mirror because it's the same person, Dr. Chen Jianren. But other countries, the top science actor may not be the top political actor in the uh, you know different realms, right? So uh, talking to the top scientists doesn't automatically translate into action on the ministerial part. So I mostly feel sad for opportunity missed. So when I speak to Japanese people around myself, so the way the China is dealing with this, that which means that they uh, do not allow uh, Taiwan to uh, participate the WHO forum, even as the observer, we we are not happy about that. Okay. Okay, they are and calling for a that, they're, they're calling a stop here. I, I don't know why, but your staff is now calling a stop. すみませんあのちょっとよろしいですか。今こちらですねあの丹さんがお答えした時にですね、時にはあの通訳の音声がこちらのパソコンから流れてるんです。だからあのあの丹さんの話とかぶってってそちらの収録には問題ないでしょう
Um, and the reason why is that what we are working on nowadays as a kind of middle power uh, in this region of the world is not just about being a geopolitical strategic point between the US and the CN, but rather the idea is that we are of broad uh, friendly relationship with not just uh, Japan. Japan remains, of course, very important, but also we have the NSTEC, uh, the New Zealand relationship, including our indigenous people with the New Zealand indigenous people. I've been to New Zealand three times, uh, to Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch uh, over the past few short years. Um, and there's many regional powers uh, that are now uh, more and more looking at Taiwan as something that uh, we can all grow our region on. For example, as I mentioned, the counter pandemic effort, the counter infodemic effort and things like that. We also consider very strong allies uh, from the EU, uh, the Czech Republic in particular, not only just visited Taiwan, the head of their Senate even said that we should Taiwan and I'm Taiwanese uh, in our legislature. Um, and so ev everything um, in the world, of course, revolves around the central idea of whether the democracies can keep being democracies, whether the modern challenges such as disinformation, uh, infodemic, can be overcome and the democracy is resilient enough to be even more democratic after the pandemic and infodemic, or are some of them tempted to go back to the authoritarian ideas. Now, as long as the general trend is not toward authoritarianism, I think Taiwan has many allies in the world. And I think that is actually also um, the um, Biden administration's idea, which is the democratic countries uniting together in a multi-stakeholder fashion. Uh, they even talk about a democracy summit right within the first year and the open government partnership, which Taiwan is now working actively. I personally participated in the previous summits as well as online on the open response and open recovery. Again, the open government partnership is something that was started um, when uh, Biden uh, was vice president. Uh, and so there's a lot of common values uh, for the Biden administration, as well as um, the previous uh, Trump administration as well. So I think we are in a pretty good place and I feel rather good about it. So probably IT technology is one of the things that encourage Taiwan's good position because nowadays you have a lot of um, the, the communication. Uh, you are very good at it. Taiwan is now very good at the, the delivering the message um, by using the IT technology. Yes, that is certainly true. As I mentioned, uh, the realm of international freedom of .tw, the domain, uh, is actually very wide. And I participated as digital minister .tw, not only uh, as part of the APAC conversation, but also at the United Nations Internet Governance Forum in Geneva um, as a robot because they don't check passports for robots. Uh, and so there are many more ways to participate meaningfully internationally outside of the traditional Westphalian ideas. So I visited Taiwan for the first time in 1994. At the time, So there was the the remains of the older times, and there was also list election on the media's activity as well, and also the there's the the intervention from the army as well, the military as well, and there were lots of uh, difficulties in the activities of the media's. However, when I look at the Taiwan as of today, so Taiwan has changed so much. This February. So actually the last, the country I visited, uh, Thai, uh, the country I visited before the pandemic was Taiwan. It was the, 
this uh, February. And uh, because the, we have the uh, our problem featured on the 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 nuclear the power plants uh, because the uh, and I personally saw that the, what uh, Taiwan is uh, doing uh, related to the, the nuclear related area is something that the other countries um, should um, refer to as well. That was my personal um, feeling after the after I visited there. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I returned to Taiwan after uh, spending some time in Germany uh, as well, and that was 1993. Uh, and so I, I agree that uh, the Taiwan that I returned to, um, I was full of this idea that if children in Germany can grow up being treated as adults instead of as like blindly obedient um, school children, uh, then certainly one day uh, the children in Taiwan can be brought up like this as well. I'm really happy to say as of last year, our new curriculum is now in the basic education and all the children um, nowadays in Taiwan now enjoy this lifelong learning experience driven by autonomy, interaction and a common good and certainly not uh, the authoritarian idea of the one true answer from the one true party. So the, you said a little bit about the Sunflower student movement. Actually, I went inside of the parliament uh, which was the, the taken by the students and the the leader at the time Lin Fei Fang I met Lin Fei Fang and last year I met Lin Fei Fang as well so from your perspective sunflower student movement had a significant uh, meaning according to what I've heard Yes, the Sunflower Movement made it cool for young people to talk about democracy uh, and social justice. Previously, the 20 NGOs, each specializing in, for example, human rights, labor conditions, new immigrants, um, the fairness of trade, um, well, 4G, cybersecurity. So all these NGOs, of course, have their followers. But the young people, the average young people on the street, if you ask them whether they have went to the activity of any of those 20 NGOs, it's quite unlikely, actually, that young people at the time were not paying a lot of attention on politics or on social justice. It wasn't considered cool. Maybe they, they pay attention to it uh, personally, but they certainly don't talk about it on social media. On the other hand, after the Occupy, it became very cool to talk about social justice. I think a lot of it is because the people who were only associated with one of the 20 NGOs suddenly discovered that there's just half a million people on the street, many more online, who care about this uh, common wealth, if you will, this common polity. And so they're now very eager to share whatever their idea is. It could range from, for example, um, that we should uh, gradually phase out plastic straws for the bubble tea to uh, we should put a bubble tea on the cover of our passport. There's all sorts of new ideas from the people as young as 15 or 16 years old, not even at the uh, age of voting, but they drive the country forward, they drive the future. So young generation they were fighting for the future, right? Yes. So at the time I was there in Taiwan and the the older generations they say like um, it it's important to have a good relationship with uh, PLC when you think about the daily life. However, young generation look at the future and if we if they kept the relationship with a PLC as it was and probably the the China would overtake 
Taiwan, which means that the older generation was looking for the past or the present. However, the younger generation were looking for the future. That is what I felt uh, when I was there at the time of the, the Sunflower Movement. Indeed, uh, there was, of course, a generational wake up uh, of the younger people, as we call it here. On the other hand, those NGOs, many of them are led by really senior people, like people in their 80s uh, or 70s or um, right. And so uh, even the, the 90s. Right. So um, I think this is true intergenerational solidarity at play. What really happens during the Sunflower Movement is that even though it is the young people that occupy the parliament, it is the really senior people that already camped outside of the parliament to protest uh, for uh, many months by that time. Uh, they uh, paved the way for the young people to enter and they work with the young people and broadcasted a lot of their messages through the live stream channels set up by the young people. The old people there, if not for the old um, guards uh, that campaigned uh, and camped outside of the legislature, maybe the police will just evacuate the occupied students immediately on the first hour. So really it is a generational solidarity. Yes, I felt the the same way as well. So at the time, the Chinese Nationalist Party uh, understood younger generation very well. They were they showed their empathy to younger generation. That that's certainly true. And uh, what we are now looking at is a idea called reverse mentorship that was introduced uh, after the Sunflower Movement, again in 2014. So the KMT uh, cabinet at the time decided that they need to learn from those young people that uh, helped facilitating the Sunflower Movement. Um, and so some cabinet members uh, worked with these young facilitators and technologists uh, in a reverse mentorship relation, in a sense that it's us who point out the direction of the future, while the senior members of the cabinet at the time helped to secure resources. The ministers with a portfolio, Jacqueline Tsai, uh, also Feng Yan, uh, was uh, in charge of the reverse mem mentorship work. And I was personally the reverse mentorship in this very office uh, back in 2014 when I was just 33 years old. So now there's lots of things going on in Hong Kong, and I assume that you are worrying about that as well. And the reverse mentorship, which you've just mentioned, and do you see that the do you think that the, the current Hong Kong government um, possibly has the same kind of um, idea? Well, what we are now looking at is not um, a something between the Hong Kong government. Uh, and the people of Hong Kong or the young people of Hong Kong. Rather, uh, it is direct intervention uh, from Beijing. Previously, Beijing would try to uh, go through the Hong Kong uh, administration as kind of an intermediary and the kind of reverse mentorship, especially after the city councillor's election um, or the regional uh, re election, it seems uh, like a possibility. But once uh, Beijing directly intervened, um, then I think the room for such interactions, I wouldn't say it's gone, it's not gone, it's still there, but it requires much more trust uh, from the administration side uh, of the Hong Kong administration. So today, according to the media coverage, Jimmy Lai, who is a very famous one, and he, actually he is uh, now prosecuted. So what do you think about that? Well, I think the um, Taiwan democratization process um, is full of stories such as currently unfolding uh, in, in Hong Kong. And we used uh, in the 80s 
uh, because both my parents were journalists. They have many stories uh, back when Taiwan was still under martial law. Sometimes we rely on the international correspondents in Hong Kong, uh, as well as the Hong Kong journalists themselves to report what's happening in Taiwan uh, for the international community to pay attention to Taiwan and to demand human rights in Taiwan. And for the Taiwan people who were exiled, they couldn't return to Taiwan anymore, to be given a stage to talk to the world uh, through the lens of the Hong Kong correspondents. Well, it seems like the situation is reversed nowadays. Uh, we are, of course, providing the room not only for the uh, Reporter Without Frontiers, but also for the Oslo Freedom Forum. Not only for the uh, NDI and IRI, which operated in Hong Kong but retreated or relocated to Taiwan, but also uh, new foundations such as the uh, Friedrich Naumann Foundation uh, from the Germany, uh, which now is also headquartering its Asia region chapter in Taiwan as well. So what we are looking at is essentially um, like a mirror uh, of a history of Taiwan's democratization process. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of sufferings, but a lot of what we can do as the people uh, who work in journalism in Hong Kong back then could do and did do for the Taiwanese people is to focus the international attention on what's really happening on the ground. Because without international attention, well, things get very bad very quickly. So you just talked about your parents. Andy, your uh, parents were journalists at the China Times, right? Yes, uh, at uh, Yu Jijong's China Times. So as far as I know, the evaluation of Taiwanese people on China Times have uh, changed dramatically in the past 30 years. What do you think about that? Well, which is why I need to qualify it as Yu Jijong's China Times uh, and not the current um, owner uh, of the franchise. Uh, my father actually uh, resigned um, immediately after the purchase. Uh, and uh, my mother, of course, uh, well, quit when I was eight years old. So that was a long time ago. Uh, and so, um, yeah, of course, there's um, a lot of difference between Yu Jijong's China Times, which not only allowed my father to work uh, on his personal capacity to visit Tiananmen um, in the protest um, of 89, and also reported uh, with rather um, brave um, words uh, what's actually happening. Uh, and he stayed in Tiananmen until the 1st of June. Uh, and then uh, Xu Zongma, who uh, took uh, his place um, as a dispatch, uh, actually got hurt uh, in the Tiananmen uh, incident uh, quite badly. Uh, but uh, of course, nowadays, under the current operator, uh, the current owner of China Times, um, my father's reports back then, and then Xu Zongma's reports back then, if you look at Chinatimes.com uh, and enter those keywords, it's gone. You, you can't see it uh, anymore. And so that explains, of course, the difference in attitude. And the same thing is now, or the similar thing is happening in Hong Kong now. Probably it um, it moves uh, faster uh, in Hong Kong compared to Taiwan. Yeah, I, I would, and of course, uh, it is uh, happening not actually ir irreversibly uh, in Taiwan. In Taiwan, we have, of course, the absolute uh, freedom of printed press. And so there's uh, more papers uh, to, to read. Uh, but of course, in Hong Kong, uh, their publication rights is currently being tested. Uh, and that is why it needs international attention. Hong Kong. So after it was written to China, at the time, it was one of the most open place around the world. And there's the, the freedom or the rule of law, which has supported Hong Kong, 
but the I was shocked uh, because the, the, these kind of values were really easily swept away. Well, um, I do not think it's really swept away as a common value. Uh, my main source of information uh, about Hong Kong is uh, Lian Deng or LIHKG. Uh, and so maybe the mainstream media uh, says one thing, but uh, LIHKG uh, says something else. Um, so I, I guess this shows uh, the resilience of the Internet generation. Also, it shows the resilience that when you can maintain secure communication in a pseudonymous configuration, then um, the people who are interested in social justice and interested in um, getting the facts out, that is to say journalistic work, uh, still uh, are working on it. I wouldn't say the value is swept away or is gone. A lot of people still care a lot in Hong Kong. So, even so now, the voices of people uh, bec is becoming smaller at this point of time. However, I do believe that it never vanishes. It is true. And uh, it is thanks to the free software, for example, GC Meet, uh, that we also uh, use, um, that uh, offers end-to-end uh, -end encrypted um, video conference mode, for example, that will protect the identities of people who join, for example, book clubs, uh, reading books about democratization together. Uh, and the like physical bookstore owners, some of them are now setting up their shop in Taiwan. Uh, and uh, in their reading gatherings, um, there's also um, democratically inclined workers when Taiwan was still under the martial law. That is a really senior people who campaigned for the democratization of Taiwan, now joining those young people in Hong Kong in reading the books that they used to read uh, during the democratization of Taiwan. So again, here, there is generational uh, solidarity and the free software people, including well, yours truly, uh, is our job to maintain that they have a safe and secure communication. So that is something uh, possible uh, only because uh, there is the information technology or the internet technology. Mm -hmm. Yes. So through the internet, you connect with people. And when you talk about that, You always talk about uh, generosity, I believe. However, when we look at what's happening on the planet, it seems like we are losing generosity. And the, it seems like the people are becoming more and more hostile especially when I look at the conflict between the US and China, I do have the kind of the feeling. So what do you think of the importance of generosity? On the internet, which connects uh, people to people, uh, a important idea is that we always must be liberal in what we accept and be conservative, disciplined in what we send. This is called the Postel's Law, a very important uh, internet norm. And on internet, of course, we are bound to meet people of all sorts of different cultures. But as long as they agree to the internet protocol, eventually, over the long time, they do get into this idea of rough consensus. That is to say, the internet's ability to make new systems without the permission of the old systems. The World Web never asked permission from Gopher. Ethereum never asked permission from Bitcoin. 
Um, so whenever there's a new generation of innovations and communications, it could be made available to the people and the culture that actually requires it to function, such as the book club I just mentioned. And that is generosity. This is the free software uh, movement. And so the main idea here I want to get across is that not everyone who lives in the .cn uh, territory agree with the .cn official media's um, position on the kind of conflict that you were saying. Many of them really clamor for the kind of civil society, well, except they cannot call it civil society, social innovation tools uh, that makes their uh, life easier, more autonomous, more secure from the state surveillance. There's many people working on that as well. And so the people who connect to the internet, as long as .cn is still part of the internet, as still it's not gone from the internet, uh, then there is still hope for the people to connect to other people as people, not as you know individuals, subjects of the Westphalian order that is indeed, as you said, is in conflict. So now going back to the subject of a country or nation. So a country always think about national interest. So that is why probably they like human relationship or that is why as they uh, tend to look at a certain, the people as the, the hostilities. So in that sense, the open society you mentioned, the, so when I look at the situation of the world, so that is the, the reverse of the the direction of the internet society or the idea of open society you just mentioned. What do you think about that? Well, um, if you go to taiwangoldcard.com, you can see that just this year alone, there's uh, more than 1,000, uh, probably 2,000 now, by the time that this episode airs, um, that there's foreign people who are not uh, Taiwanese citizens who do not hold a passport of the Transcultural Republic citizens uh, and uh, decide to stay in Taiwan for up to three years on the gold card um, idea. And it entitles them to not only work here, start a business here, uh, enjoy health care uh, alongside their families, but actually is available to anyone who, uh, for example, have successfully run a startup uh, to a uh, IPO or to a MNA to a publicly listed company. That is to say entrepreneurs, digital nomads, they automatically qualify for the gold card. And we have a lot of those people in Taiwan now still working on their own subject, but available here also as mentors uh, to Taiwanese talents. And if they stay here for a while, like because it's, uh, you can apply again on the second uh, gold card term on the fifth year, for example, many of them would then apply for naturalization and get a voting right here. Uh, not just permanent residence, but actually um, citizenship. But we do not require them if they contribute uh, well to our society. We do not require them to renounce their original passport. They can hold to that passport as well and become also Taiwanese. Uh, and that, I think, is a concrete idea uh, and an idea well implemented and actually well loved this year uh, that many people look beyond the nationalist uh, impulses and become de facto Taiwanese or also Taiwanese because they like the system here of healthcare, of education, of entrepreneurship. So listening to what you are saying, in the past, Taiwan was the land of nationalists, I would say. However, now it's the, the very advanced area. And now I feel like I'm understanding bit by bit why Taiwan is becoming uh, like this. Yeah, well, I, I just translated the official kanji uh, name uh, of the country, uh, Zhonghua Mingguo, uh, to the Transcultural Republic of Citizens. It's my own rendition. This is not the official translation, uh, but it shows the kind of uh, new outlook uh, of the transculturalism that is Taiwan.
So, on the other hand, obviously Taiwan Strait, the other country which has a technology. However, it's an authoritarian country, which means that the IT technology is advancing. However, still the country is controlling everything. So what do you think, uh, what would happen to that type of uh, country in the future? Well, it's a amplifier, right? AI could be made into authoritarian intelligence. But in Taiwan, AI could be made into assistive intelligence. So it amplifies both the authoritarian instinct, even to the degree of totalitarianism, whereas previous totalitarian regimes were at most subtotal. But now, technologically, it could be totally total. But here, as assistive technologists, we are also perfecting AI to be assistive, to be aligned with the privacy and dignity, to be privacy preserving, and also to be assistive in the sense of giving accountability. So indeed, one side is making the citizen transparent to the state, and the other side making the state transparent to the citizens. Uh, and the technology, of course, amplifies both instincts. So in your book, you talked about Doraemon is the one of the ideal type of AI. And actually, I'm older for Doraemon's generation. I don't know about Doraemon that much. Okay. So what do you think? So what do you think of Doraemon? Um, first of all, um, although you do see uh, me listed as author of that book, I've not proofread that book, and I don't get royalties. It is a series of interviews that I publicly gave away the copyright, so anybody can do whatever with it. So um, it's a book, uh, a edited collection of the actual interviews that we did, just like the interview that we are having now, uh, but I did not proofread its content. On the other hand, uh, Doraemon, I did talk about Doraemon many times. I even cosplayed Doraemon uh, in one of the films uh, that's filmed by the Ministry of e Economy Affairs in Taiwan. My idea about uh, the Doraemon is very simple. Each Doraemon episode shows how one technology, if introduced to the society, may invite surprisingly negative impacts. And so a lot of the episode in the Doraemon is based on the idea of showing a little bit, like in a sandbox, how a new technology may w interact with the society and ending up declaring that maybe the society is better off with only a fragment of the technology that is pro-social and maybe those technologies parts that are anti-social uh, is not a good fit uh, for the protagonist. But you do not see like the Terminator series, Doraemon um, presiding over uh, the other children, even though that Doraemon certainly is a very capable robot. Uh, they are already uh, portraying all the assistive robots in an assistive role, not in an authoritarian role. So when I want to explain assistive intelligence, like a very intelligent assistant, Doraemon is of course a good example. So probably because I don't know AI word well, we tend to imagine George Orwell kind of world would um, happen in the future, which means that the AI would dictate us. So the, is there any possibility that the AI would dictate human being? Well, in the George Orwell world, AI doesn't dictate over people. The big brother dictates over people through AI. Right. So um, AI doesn't enslave people. People enslave people through AI. Uh, and it's true today as well. What we are now looking at is a unprecedented concentration of power. It could be state surveillance. It could also be surveillance capitalism. If people give in 
to the norm of being surveilled all the time, giving up their agency, then of course it becomes terrifying. But it's not the AIs that are terrifying. It's the people using AIs in this way that are terrifying. That's my response. I see. And when I t talk with Chinese friends, so there are several values we share with Taiwan, such as democracy, freedom, transparency, and open government. And toward these values, the Chinese friends would say that that was a value uh, which were imposed by uh, Western countries and probably what is doing in in China, what uh, the Communist Party does in China would better because now we are we have the prosperity. And the other times there were people who were understandable to the, the Western idea, even though these people now say that kind of thing. So now I feel there's the distance uh, between my Chinese uh, friends who say something like that. So what do you think about this? Well, certainly um, what they are saying, which is uh, a prosperity based uh, narrative is is true. I mean, it's based on facts. Um, it is true that they work very hard uh, to transform people out of poverty. And I'm not saying that it's it's not a worthy work. Of course, it is a worthy work. Just as um, they, through the use of lockdowns, uh, did manage in many provinces uh, to counter the coronavirus. And that is factual. I'm not disputing that lockdowns, especially when it's initiated early, are useful. What I'm trying to say is that there are alternatives that are better. When we say we fight a pandemic with no lockdowns, we didn't say we just let the virus run rampant. We say that we run very careful communication campaigns that says wear a mask to protect your own face against your own hand. It's rational self-interest. It's not Western. I mean, the mask is not Eastern or Western. It is just a neutral technology, a physical vaccine uh, that protects my own face against my own hands. By getting this message to pretty much everyone and by getting this message uh, to be entirely nonpartisan, everybody in Taiwan understood the importance of it very early on. And that enabled a lockdown free counter pandemic effort which led to unprecedented growth on the retail and catering sectors, for example. So I'm not saying that uh, lockdowns are not useful, or I'm not saying that the takedowns, the encroachment on free press couldn't uh, you know, produce the effect the designer of the Great Firewall intended it to produce. Uh, what I'm trying to say is just like takedowns, lockdowns have adversarial externalities. It reduces social trust. People feel that they have to give up a lot more information than previously required in the name of the pandemic. It hurts the civil society, organizations, solidarity. So it has externalities. And Taiwan managed to fight a pandemic and infodemic without incurring such externalities. So maybe it is a good model, the Taiwan model, to be learned uh, worldwide. And this is the argument I'm making. I'm not saying that it's not useful to have a prosperous or to bring people out of poverty or to fight against the coronavirus through their particular fashion of ways. I'm just pointing out the negative externalities. You just mentioned the infodemic. So under the pandemic, sometimes I feel like the there's so much the information, and the when we look at the, what's going on in the state, 
I wonder how many times we hear the word fake news. So there are things such like uh, fake news and the infodemic. So what do you think of uh, these kind of uh, things, infodemic and the um, fake news? Yeah, uh, I personally don't use the, the F word, the, the fake news word, quote unquote. Um, because in Mandarin, you see, uh, news, 新闻, uh, is the same words as journalism, 新闻工作 or 新闻业. Um, so because they literally share the same word, there is no way to say fake news in Mandarin, 假新闻, without offending journalists, like accusing them uh, as imposters or producing misleading content. And because, as I mentioned, and you know very well, both my parents are journalists. So uh, I can't say the F word out of, you know, filial piety, a respect of uh, my parents. Rather, we say disinformation, intentional untruths that cause public harm. And the way that we frame it is that it must be intentional and it must harm the public. If it only harmed the image of a minister, it's just good journalism. But it, if it harms the health or harms the democratic institution like the voting system, then of course it becomes disinformation and therefore subject to the kind of penalties, the public prosecutions and so on. So making a clear delineation of journalists and people who participate in journalists on one side and people who intentionally manipulate information to incite distrust and public harm on the other. This delineation is very important. Without such delineation, by using words such as fake news or jia xinwen in Mandarin, uh, then we risk confusing those two together and alienate or even uh, attack the journalistic profession, which is actually like the antibody uh, to the infodemic. And so uh, I don't make this um, word jia uh, xinwen in any of my public speeches. In English, it's a little bit better because news and journalism are two different words. So our TV program, depending on what we feature, sometimes the we get the criticism on the internet that the, our program is biased and such. I'm not saying that the, we do not hear the criticism on the internet. However, there are very clear criticism going on the internet to the old media because the, the, the internet is, a, so to say, the anonymous space. And sometimes I feel like there's the uh, incorrect criticism uh, on the old media. So what do you think about that? I think everyone is media now. Uh, everyone who has a phone, especially in Taiwan, where we have broadband as a human right. So it costs just like 16 US dollars per month for unlimited connection in 4G. So people might as well use more of it, right? So if you live stream all the time, uh, you're essentially reporting what's going on uh, around you. So instead of saying like the media people are the elites and the consumers of media need to have media literacy, which is the old way of looking at things. Nowadays, starting last year, we teach media competence meaning that even for primary school people, they need to understand that journalists are not just content producers. The written journalism is not just producing text. Uh, editors are not just text processors. Um, we need to first get the primary schoolers, as well as the very senior people, uh, all the generations, understanding what's a journalistic norm. Why is fact-checking important? Why is bias detected early on through the framing effect important? Why is it important to validate but protect your sources? These are kind of 101 of journalism, very basic of journalism. But once people understand it's not just about producing content, but rather it is engaging in collective fact finding, that is to say journalism, then we get much more high quality input 
they criticize because they care probably. But if you show them how to contribute to journalism, I'm sure, like in the Taiwanese presidential debate and the platforms, there's thousands of volunteers who volunteered to type the transcript of all the presidential candidates' words to segment it into assertions and sentences to separate the factual claims with the feelings, the personal observations, and then fact check the factual things and publish it in a collective fashion. And this fact checking mechanism is co-created by some of the oldest media such as Hua Shi, uh, and then also some established media such as Gong Shi, the public TV, but also the new media team within the public TV. Like the P Sharp Lab, as well as some truly internet, as you said, pseudonymous or anonymous people that contribute over the internet. It's a beautiful collaboration to see. So maybe we can think about given five minutes or even just fifty seconds, if they can take the time to criticize、um, your television online, maybe they can also help fact checking something. So, I'm learning a lot. So we, so to say, the old media or mass media, probably we were protected when there was no the internet. So. When we look at the New York Times, the Washington Post, the CNN, so what they say is quite different from the the the, the pub, general public as well, and probably the reason uh, of uh, and probably it's our responsibility, the old media's responsibility, that there is a huge gap between these two. That is what I felt. That's true, and. While of course your television is filming me in this dialogue, we are also filming you, filming me、uh, on another camera right here, and our film will be published to YouTube、uh, under Creative Commons, and anyone can just collect that and. Make it into a rap song. A, a band called Dos Monos in Japan actually did that. They took fragments of one of my interviews and remix it into a rap song.、Uh, and so this is,、uh, I think, what is really going on on the internet is that people are remixing each other's work a lot. And if we、uh, encourage the norm. Around this pro-social sharing of creativity, then it actually leads to everybody becoming more capable of engaging in journalism and democratic dialogue. But if you do not give them the material to remix, then of course people still fill in on whatever conspiracy theorists or whatever people who incite、uh, revenge or discrimination out of outrage. I mean, the desire. For remixing material is always there, but we need to actively engage them with the kind of material that we think are journalistic. So our TV program. So actually, in older days,、uh, when we had an interview with the international guest. We got some the the criticism that it is not possible to see it from overseas. However, now、um, it's possible to upload、uh, the contents after the the air、uh, is done after it's、uh, being on air. Now it's for free and it's on online, which、yeah. means that finally now the the we are. Flee、uh, from the the publishing lights, or whether we are flee from the 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 any charges、um, related to that. That's right. The the book you are holding is a testament to that. I did not proofread the book. I did not、uh, do anything other than saying I relinquish my copyright. Do whatever you want with it. And then、uh, it became the kind of book、uh, that the editor's、um, imagination. Lead the book, the curation of the book. Yeah, that's the book I was referring to. There's another book called A Letter to Freedom. It's done the same way,、uh, and so I think this is a, a new 
Yes, exactly. Yes, you have both books. So both books,、um, I have no review rights, and I agreed、uh, to dedicate all the dialogues and interviews that was the content of those books,、uh, just like all my other interviews, into the public domain, which is why they can print me、uh, and my name on it, but without. Uh, you know, any、uh, royalty or without any fear of me suing them over copyright because I've relinquished my copyright already,、uh, and so this is my vision.、Uh, basically, offering everything that I work in the、uh, public sector as public material, not just for the citizens of Taiwan, but for everyone to remix. Not free from the various kind of thing. For instance, I I cannot say I'm free from a nation. I'm not free from gender, and I'm not free from language. There's the the language barrier between us. And I'm not free from that. On the other hand, when our Minister of Health and Welfare, Minister Chen Shizhong,、uh, put on not a rainbow mask, a pink mask,、uh, I think he become a little bit more free、uh, from the gender stereotypes. Everybody can be a little bit、uh, more freed. So this is not about absolute freedom. This is about flexibility、uh, of the mind. So, sir, could you please、uh, talk a little bit about that uh, pink uh, mask um, event? Sure.、Um, so, back in April, I think it was twelfth、uh, of April,、um, there was a news that says a a young boy called the CECC,、uh, the one nine two two, that's the toll free number, where the call center usually answers each and every question, ninety five percent of the questions answered about the epidemic. However, the young person was asking, "Hey, I'm a young boy." All my classmates who are boys、uh, have blue masks to wear. But when you're a Chanel mask, why is the case that we get only the pink medical mask and we don't get to pick the color?、Uh, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to be the only boy that wears pink.、Uh, and the call center people don't know how to answer this question, so it gets escalated immediately、uh, to the CECC. Now the very next day. The next 2 p.m. on the press conference, live streamed and broadcast over TV, all the medical officers, regardless of gender, wore pink. And the minister Chen Shizong even said that when he was a boy,、uh, his idol was the Pink Panther. So not only the boy become the most hip boy in his class, for only he has the color that the heroes wear, but also the heroes heroes.、Uh, and so the main idea here. Is that everyone can look beyond gender stereotype a little bit by performing, as Judith Butler would say, performing a little bit more transgender. It frees everyone's imagination, and for a while, for at least a couple weeks, all the trending brands and so on in Taiwan, all the fashion brands and so on. If you look at their social media profile, they're all pink. Pink became the most trendy color、uh, on the second half of April here.、Uh, of course, eventually、uh, there's the pride parade and rainbow become very fashionable. But、uh, sorry, I digress. The whole point is that making mask something that unifies people together instead of having this binary category of boys wearing blue mask and girls wear pink masks. Why don't we just say you know wear whatever? Color that you like, Pink Panther is Mr. Chen's childhood idol. Why not?、Uh, and so that I think is、uh, a little bit more freedom. But of course, we wouldn't say that suddenly all the medical officers become, you know, transgender individuals. That's maybe pushing it too far. But they become a little bit more transgender that day. So I love that story, the pink mask story. Probably the Japanese politician do not have the kind of the flexibility. Probably they cannot do that same kind of thing. I don't know. They can try. It's fun.
And another thing that I remember from your book is that the when you were in Germany, the, the Germans do not treat kids as kids, which means that the there's the kids clothes and there are certain the tools for kids, which means that there's the separation between adults and kids. Indeed, uh, if children are treated as grown-ups, they grow up faster. It's called the Pygmalion effect. So, what was it like for you when you were young? You stopped. Uh, you stopped going to school, and the, probably the I can say that the that might be quite tough, or the probably sometimes you felt some loneliness uh, when I think of the society like Japan. Well, um, I quit school because the head of my middle school said that. After reviewing my exchange with researchers online, she thinks my time is better spent online than go to her school. So she said, tomorrow you don't have to go to school anymore and I will cover for you. By covering for me, she means that she will fake the record to the Ministry of Education. So I don't get fined for not showing up to compulsory education. So this incident uh, put in my mind uh, this idea that the public service, the career public servants, are the most innovative people in the world. And I can't shake out that feeling. Uh, it's ingrained in my mind. Uh, so public sector innovation uh, is, a, is a real thing. And so with the head of school's blessing, of course, I joined the internet research community working on free software and so on. But that makes me actually more socialized and less alone because I feel that no matter where I am, in whichever jurisdiction, it could be an authoritarian regime, but there are still free software activists uh, in their, that regime working together on a better, more solidarity-oriented world. And so I wouldn't say it's isolation or loneliness. So what would be the ideal the public servant? Well, obviously, the ideal public servant is one that facilitates cross-sectoral communication. That is to say, entirely horizontal, instead of being top-down, like requiring each sectoral stakeholders to communicate only through the central authority. And actually, Minister Chen Shizhong is a really good role model of a uh, civil servant that works in a horizontal way. No matter how ridiculous the suggestion is from 1922, or no matter how weird the questions seem to be from the reporters asking him questions, he always goes like, yeah, it's a great idea. We should think about this together. Oh, legislator, please teach. Right? So he has always this humility that says, even if he is notionally commander of the CECC, as soon as you have a better idea that he has not thought, he is ready to connect you with the career public service to implement your idea. It could be the pink mask. It could be pink panther. It could be using traditional rice cookers to cook the mask to kill the virus, but doesn't kill the mask. Uh, and even though it sounds absurd, Mr. Chen actually cooked a mask on the live streamed press conference while Professor Lai Chen Yu, the social innovator, explained the theory. Um, and so all this shows that a horizontally connected facilitative minister, how that actually unifies the entire country when countering the pandemic rather than a very totalitarian one. So now we've been talking quite a long time, but let me go back to the, the beginning or the starting point of this interview. When we look at two superpowers, 
China and the states, and uh, now we see that there's um, the the tendency which is not tolerant, and how we should um, deal with them. One very concrete、uh, idea is that we need to work on common problems that are too big for a single superpower to fix.、Um, infodemic. Is actually a really good topic on on this particular regard. Dot CN, that's to say, the PRC regime spends more、uh, budget than its defense budget on fighting the infodemic. It's it's a known fact. They they say it、uh, publicly that they spend a lot of effort and energy on harmonization,、uh, and the infodemic, of course, also. Threatens the journalistic profession. The more liberal a democracy is, the more threatened existing journalistic players are from the infodemic. This is also true, and you already outlined how the old media is being、uh, pressured by the infodemic, sometimes toxic content on the public internet. So it seems that even for the authoritarian regimes like the PRC. As long as they don't disconnect from the internet, this whole harmonization thing is going to be a pressure for them. And for the liberal democracies, what we are doing now is essentially、uh, developing our own antibodies to each and every assault、uh, to the、uh, general population that tries to incite polarization and so on. So maybe some sort of collaboration is possible here. Some sort of like. Covax of the mind, right? So sharing the antibodies,、uh, whereas we understand, of course, the playbook of a very cute spokesdog, the Zhongchai,、uh, recommending people to wear a mask by showing cute Shiba Inus. Maybe it's not for everyone, but certainly the Shiba Inu doesn't care whether it's authoritarian or whether it's liberal or social democracy. So on those very concrete issues about the infodemic, for example, maybe we can agree on a package of norms around behavior to protect the core of the internet from state-based meddling, and also to conduct understanding over the internet that are more pro-social, but not. Of course, authoritarian. So these are one concrete topic. After the pandemic, I guess everyone will shift their attention、uh, to how to、uh, do better on SARS 3.0 on the next pandemic. And infodemic resilience, I think, is one such idea that、uh, everyone can collaborate and contribute, regardless of whether they are authoritarian or democratic. For instance, in case of the United States, they are advocating democracy. However, especially after Trump administration, they put America first, which means they are they are literally building the walls. And the same kind of the movement is happening in Brazil or even in Japan. So, what do you think the situation? Well, sometimes.、Uh Wars are important. Like this is a war between my nose and my own hand,、uh, and so sometimes it exists、uh, for a good reason. Uh, however, uh, those sort of wars need to be evaluated over time. We understood, of course, masks are important against the virus. We understood humor is important to counter the infodemic. On the other hand, the sort of the wars in our minds, for example, nationalist agenda. It could be directed into something that is beneficial, like co-creation of a common value. This is good, and eventually, just like the masks, the rainbow and pink colors, it does build solidarity. On the other hand, if nationalism is directed toward vengeful、um, attack to other nations, or whether it's for discrimination of other nations, then of course that is less than good. Um, so I'm saying that nationalistic tendencies or even some competition is necessarily a bad thing. If it's so bad, we will not have Olympic games,、uh, but which is a nationalist thing.、Uh, but uh, to direct it to more pro-social 
and also more co-creative approaches. So this information technology, which has a lot of the future possibilities, and the, I think now China and US are fighting over information technology. So do you see any positive uh, things out of it, or there's more negative outcome out of it? Well, there's a, a lot of different norms, right? So the data norms, for example, that are currently being debated. Uh, it could concentrate all the data to the state, which is the PRC model. Surveillance capitalism, which was the U.S. model, but now the U.S. government, uh, the both parties actually are waking up to it, uh, especially California has been doing something to counter surveillance capitalism. Uh, and the EU, uh, which is a human right based way like the GDPR, uh, which as I understand Japan and Taiwan are actually thinking more alongside the GDPR terms when it comes to data norms. So maybe we are honorary Europeans in that regard. Uh, so in any case, what I'm trying to say is that there's more than one ways to solve a problem. And the uh, competition currently we are seeing uh, around the norms is very important that we are not caught in the zero sum thinking of whether it's state or the capitalists owning all the data, that that's not a good tendency to think. Uh, rather, I would advocate, for example, a social sector first approach to data norms. Um, actually, in Japan, there is an enabling act called the Information Bank uh, that talks about a trusted intermediary. And the EU is doing the same on the Data Governance Act and so on. So maybe we can build a norm that combines the best of the two models together the efficiency and the trustworthiness without the bad parts of the uh, CN and .US models. And that is innovation, and that could be good, uh, a good result from this competition. So having various choices in order to do so, disclosure or uh, transparency is essential isn't it? The state need to be transparent to its citizens when making decisions, certainly. Uh, the citizen probably not transparent to the state. So could you please elaborate a bit more about that? Certainly. So um, when we talk about radical transparency, I mean that the cameras are pointed on me. I'm not pointing my camera to the staff that you have here, right? So their privacy is preserved. Uh, and so this is quite symbolic. If people can all understand what their ministers is doing, then they are much more active as citizens because they understand the limitations, the brainstorming, as well as the early stage drafts that the minister is working with. And they often have better than minister ideas which I was just talking about with Mr. Chen Shizong, he always says, oh, you, you know better, yeah, please, <laughs> let's work together, right? So that's uh, the good thing about making the state transparent to the citizens. On the other hand, the citizens have a right to self-determination when it comes to the privacy boundaries. So if the citizen is forced to make themselves known to the state, even when they don't want to, then of course it creates a power imbalance and then the state can essentially force a citizen to do things they don't want to do without invoking the rule of law. They can just invoke some algorithm and the citizen will have to do whatever the state wants the citizen to do. We see that in PRC, especially in Xinjiang all the time. Uh, and so I think the main point here is that for, um, I would say uh, citizen oriented policy making always make the state transparent, but a citizen can be as opaque or transparent as they want to be any point in time. So what Beijing is doing is that the, they 
go into the, the hidden area. However, this, at the same time, they ask people to expose themselves to the general public. Yes, and, and they call it, uh, quote unquote, social credit. Uh, and uh, each provincial government under the umbrella of social credit could invent new ways uh, for algorithm, for code, essentially, uh, to surpass the code of law. The code of algorithms could dictate uh, who gets preferential treatment on household registration, who get to take an airplane, who doesn't get to take an airplane, who takes um, the priority on the high-speed rails, who couldn't even book uh, the um, higher classes uh, of cabins and high-speed rails and so on. And so all in all, this is a system that uh, exposes, as you said, people to one another by encouraging people actually sometimes to, to snitch uh, on one another. And, and Taiwan actually knows about this. 40 years ago, we were like this, 50 years ago. But when I go to Shenzhen, there are people working for huge companies like Huawei or Tencent. And I feel like young people there are very vibrant. So aren't they? What do you think about that? They, they are. They certainly are. Um, and I think, of course, uh, the young people, especially like the really young people, I'm talking about like teenagers or in the early 20s, uh, for them, um, the firewall is already there as part of their life. Uh, the kind of harmonization of social media content, well, they didn't uh, know anything else, right? So for them, it's a natural habitat. They were born uh, into a post-Great Firewall internet environment. Some of them, of course, especially if they work at Huawei or Tencent, eventually learn how to use a VPN, um, although it's of questionable legality nowadays. Uh, but many of them, of course, uh, took whatever s situation there as natural because that's that's human nature. On the other hand, if you are talking about people in their 30s or 40s who briefly remember the kind of time where the Great Firewall wasn't that great at all, then they, of course, notice something is amiss, something is lost there. I'm confirming talking to the staff to if there's any additional question or not. So, so thank you very much for joining us for such a long hours. Is there any the message or the, is there anything that you would like to deliver to the, the audience, if any? Well, um, I would just sign off uh, with my usual greeting, which is live long and prosper. That's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> High five. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, one thing. One oh yeah, thing. one thing. One more thing. So the anchor woman of our TV program, she is very much interested in the, the gender, the related topics, and uh, probably the next year, she would love to uh, talk with you. So which means that the, we will be sending you another letter to ask you to join our TV program in the future. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm sure by next year, there will still be uh, gender uh, in Taiwan. Although our new ID card doesn't even have a gender here anymore, uh, but <laughs> that this is our new new ID card, uh, and it only has the name uh, and the number, birthday, but it doesn't say anything about genders, uh, and the uh, uh, spouse uh, field is gone as well. It only says whether you're married or single, so people cannot tell your sexual orientation by looking at your name and your spouse's name. Uh, so we are moving. Uh, gradually uh, to a post-gender society, not uh, immediately, but very gradually. So I'm happy to talk about that as well next year. So actually, I wanted you to meet um, uh, face to face um, in Taipei rather than having this remote interview.
Yeah, definitely. I mean, as soon as we have the vaccine, which is why I, why I mentioned COVAX, as soon as the COVAX batch arrives, uh, then we are going to meet face to face. So maybe by March or April, we'll know. So I would like to eat a tasty Taiwanese food. I can't wait. Definitely, definitely. Uh, we'll have some um, maybe bubble tea uh, with sushi. <laughs> so thank you very much for the for sparing your time with us. Thank you. Arigato gozaimashita. Hello. Thank you. 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 Thank you.